Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. How many of you have voted? All right, good. That's a lot of you. Those you have not, those who have not, right, go. Make your voice heard. Right, last day to do so. The fate of civilization hangs in the balance no matter which um, viewpoint you are espousing. So, um, we've been talking about modernism in a sort of European context for the last uh, couple sessions, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about modernism as we've discussed it, what does it look like? What do some of its common features seem to be? How do, I, how do we identify a modernist text? What does it do? It's usually very angry. Okay, you would say sort of um, an angry or defiant kind of tone? Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Against, like, the past and old ways in general. Okay, anti-tradition. Good, what else? What else have we noticed about some of the modernist texts we've been looking at? Think back to the futurists and Dadaists and surrealists and to Kafka. Okay, good. What do you mean, Sarah? What do you mean by analytical? Okay, yeah, there is a kind of defiance of the normal, certainly, right? And also the afterlife. How so? Explain the afterlife thing. Um, the one we read about the game is like, you're, um, your soul exists outside your body. Okay, yeah, definitely, yeah, bigger focus on urban life, right? We don't have people going out and getting it together in the country here, right? Yeah, we're talking about city life, contemporary settings, right? Yeah, go ahead. The people are pretty, uh, just normal people too, there's no one too drastically, like, like everyone's just an everyday person. Yeah, we don't have heroes or gods running around, right? We don't have um, these kinds of you know great strivers we saw in Romanticism, like no Faust types running about, no Rousseau types running around feeling everything. Yeah, we're dealing with ordinary people by and large. And how do these ordinary people in these modernist texts tend to deal with their circumstances? To what extent do they seem to be able to rise above their circumstances in any of these texts? Typically, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah they're, they're mostly sort of beaten down by their particular context, right? So we're not just talking about ordinary, everyday people. We're generally talking about powerless people. people who don't fit into their society and are at the same time victimized by it. Now, what did you make of this story? Weird. How'd this go for you? Okay, what, what's weird about it? I'm fixated on capitalism. Okay. I think it's kind of sad. What makes it sad? Well, now, I'm not an armchair psychologist, but I okay. read one on TV. Okay. Uh, obviously, this seems to be like written like the diary by some sort of paranoid schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. he, he's like a sick person. He, everything is some sort of hallucination, uh -huh. or him putting A to Z so he equals B. Like, okay. Here's the question I would put to you, though, right? Now, we actually have two different narrators here, but you're focusing here on the narrator who wrote the diary, rather than the narrator who's presenting the diary to us, right? Can we be absolutely certain that the narrator who wrote the diary is wrong or crazy? 
in the wrong capacity. Well, you know, we, we only have his perspective to go on, right? And we already know what's happened to him and his quote unquote madness, right? That's given to us in the little prologue. That, you know, okay, he's been cured and he's been sent off to await some official appointments um, in another city. So this is the record of his period of madness, right? But how do we typically define, oops, madness? Uh, come here, Ethan. What does it mean to be mad? Having out of the way thoughts and feelings. Okay, out of the way thoughts and feelings. All right, out of the normal thoughts and feelings. Every time I hear or see the word madness, I mm -hmm. think of that definition that says um, madness is doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's okay. Different results. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And right. Is, is that the same yeah. Thing? Um, yeah, well, we, we, we tend to use the words interchangeably, right? Mm -hmm. Although insanity actually is a legal term. Insanity is a legal definition. Um, <clears throat> you know, you are someone who is incompetent to stand trial due to mental state is insane. Madness is sort of more a common parlance kind of term. And why? Why do we define people who do these kinds of out of the way things as mad? Are they always dangerous? No, it's just a different way of thinking that doesn't fit mm -hmm. in society. What the society's beliefs are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That the person's in. Yeah. What madness is really is a kind of deviation, right? You don't see the world in the way that everyone else does. In some cases, this is for medical chemical reasons. But I think it's arguable the madness of this particular narrator, if it is madness, arises from cultural factors rather than from anything that seems to be medically wrong with him. Although um, I should note that uh, Lu Sung, uh, the guy who wrote this particular story, uh, was trained as a medical doctor, but never practiced. And he studied medicine in Japan rather than in China. And this is because uh, Japan was, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, uh, much more in touch with Western methods and with Western society than China was. So a lot of uh, st progressive students who wanted to learn more about the world outside of China chose to study in Japan rather than in China because there they could learn Western medicine rather than um, the Chinese medicine that Lu Sun regarded as quackery. Right, you remember we talked about those five processes and everything, you know, Taoist alchemy, um, things of that nature, when we talked about the story of the stone, a lot of that is all worked into traditional Chinese medicine. And Lu Sun was part of a cultural movement that was trying to move beyond traditional beliefs, traditional behaviors that he thought uh, were holding China back. Now the music that I was playing for you um, is an example of this kind of new cultural openness in China in the early 20th century. Um, one of you noted that it sounded to you like something from a Betty Boop cartoon. And yeah, I mean, well, I mean, look at the era, right? In the 1920s, what kind of music do we associate, say, with, you know, the, with US pop culture? in that era? What would you have been hearing on the radio? Swing? Yeah, you'd hear a lot of swing and big band music, right? Which was typically the soundtrack to something like a Betty Boop cartoon. 
And what this is doing, what shida, uh, Shidaiku, uh, which was um, a form of pop music that was invented uh, in Shanghai, this guy, Ji Lin, Lin Hui, is the uh, primary exponent of it. What he was doing was taking this Western pop music, this big band swing music, um, American jazz, and he was adding to it Chinese classical music, um, Chinese traditional instruments, um, Chinese folk music values, right? So one thing that you probably noticed is that the singer has a much <coughs> higher pitched voice than we would normally be comfortable with in a pop song, right? This is something that's still fairly common in Asian pop music, right? Um, have any of you ever heard of, uh, like one of the most popular forms of uh, pop music in India, it's called playback music. And it sounds sort of like Western pop with a few Indian instruments thrown in. And the female singers usually have very, very, very high squeaky voices. You just find a lot of high squeaky female voices um, in Asian pop music. Um, Western pop music tends to prefer sort of more the smoky alto female voice, or like you know something you know a singer like Adele, for example, wouldn't get as far probably in Asia as she does in Europe and the U.S. Right? Different musical tastes, different musical values, but in this form, they're colliding with each other. Now. What Lu Sun was getting in Japan was not just uh, a medical education. Japan shares a border, a sort of maritime border, an ocean border, with Russia. And in fact, at the time, was at war with Russia. Now, this meant, you know, one, cultural attitudes towards the Russians were fairly negative, but it also meant that there was a lot of Russian literature available in Japan. So Lu Sun, who had been educated in his childhood as a Confucian scholar, was also reading and translating into Chinese Dostoevsky, Nikolai Gogol, Leo Tolstoy, all these great Russian realists of the 19th century. So what most modernisms involve that we haven't really discussed too deeply yet is a kind of clash of traditions, right? Or a kind of blending of cultural traditions. Um, <clears throat> you, you have a, a society that is regarded as kind of static and sick and either unchanging or changing in the wrong ways. And so a group of writers aim to redirect cultural energies by bringing forces in from outside. Now, in the case of some European modernisms, right, that outside force is a machine or the exploration of your own subconscious. In others, uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, paintings by Picasso? How many seen Picasso paintings? Okay. Have you ever noticed how much some of the faces in a lot of Picasso paintings look like African masks? Yeah, and that's absolutely on purpose. Right? He's drawing on artistic traditions from Africa to try to enliven what he feels are sort of moribund European artistic traditions. Uh, you, see, you hear similar things in uh, music, classical composers trying to inject um, folk melodies into classical music to give it a little bit of a kick in the ass. Um, you find, um, where was I going with this? Um, a, the, the great British modernist poem, actually written by an American, uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, The Wasteland, um, he draws in not only elements of European mythology, but also um, a good deal of Hindu and Buddhist thought, right? So modernism is very much involved in this kind of cosmopolitan blending of traditions from around the world. Like it, it's, and it often kind of comes across 
as a kind of random mixing and matching, right? Well, I'll take a little bit of Hinduism here, and I'll take a little bit of Hungarian folk music here, and I'll take um, a few African masks here, and voila, I've got a ballet. But this kind of pastiche, right, aims to create an art that kind of transcends these national traditions. So what about the form of this? Do you notice anything weird about the form of this, the way this is written? How is this presented to us? Very informal. Not like how the sword and, mm -hmm. not like how the, the sword and the stone, you know. Not like how the, <laughs> the story of the stone? Yes, how the story of the stone was written, which was mm -hmm. very rigid and structured and traditional. Uh-huh. OK, is the whole thing presented to us informally. What part of it is very informal? The diary part, the diary part is very informal, right? The personal thoughts of the so-called madman or deviant, right? What about the little prologue at the beginning? We look on page 244 at the beginning of the story. There was once a pair of male siblings whose actual names I beg your indulgence to withhold. Suffice it to say that we three were boon companions during our school years. Subsequently, circumstances contrived to rend us asunder so that we were gradually bereft of knowledge regarding each other's activities. Not too long ago, however, I chanced to hear that one of them had been hard afflicted with a dread disease. I obtained this intelligence at a time when I happened to be returning to my native haunts and hence made so bold as to detour somewhat from my normal course in order to visit them. I encountered but one of the siblings. He apprised me that it had been his younger brother who had suffered the dire illness. By now, however, he had long since become sound and fit again. In fact, he had already repaired to other parts to await a substantive official appointment. The elder brother apologized for having needlessly put me to the inconvenience of this visitation and concluding his disquisition with a hearty smile showed me two volumes of diaries which, he assured me, would reveal the nature of his brother's disorder during those fearful days. As to the lapsus calami that occur in the course of the diaries, I have altered not a word. Nonetheless, I have changed all the names, despite the fact that their publication would be of no great consequence, since they are all humble villagers unknown to the world at large. Recorded the second day in the seventh year of the Republic. Would we regard the language of this little <coughs> prologue piece as informal? No. It, like, um, seems very official. Yeah, very official, elevated, lots of big Latinate words, right? Now, what Lusun is going for here is an effect that probably comes off better in Chinese than it does in English, right? For the following reason. This is written in a different dialect than the diary part is. Most Chinese literature and most official documents were written in a sort of artificial classical dialect that was called Wenyan. And Wen Yan was an attempt to reconstruct the old-fashioned, you know, sort of the historical Chinese language of, sort of you know, the days of Confucius. Right, so it's a kind of backward-looking <clears throat> dialect. And you only understood Wen Yan if you were somebody who was educated in the Confucian tradition. Right. Wen Yan made virtually no sense to anybody who had not received this kind of education. So it was a kind of elite dialect. Yeah, go ahead, Ashley. So it would kind of be like if, let's say, the first half for us would be written in Latin, and then the rest would be written in another common language? It would be more like um, if the first part was written in, say, Shakespearean English. And then the rest was written in common everyday language. Um, 
English doesn't really have, um, English has never really had an equivalent of Wen Yan, you know, a sort of formal, constructed, official dialect like that. But yeah, um, any attempt to sound really sort of old fashioned and jargony and archaic um, would probably, or like the same, if you like did all that in like the language of the King James Bible or something like that, right? Now, the rest of this is written in a dialect called Bai Hua. And Bai Hua was a sort of official vernacular. It wasn't spoken or used all over China, but it was typically used by officials in various cities communicating with each other. So it was the closest thing to an official vernacular language, an official vernacular spoken and written language that a country that was as large and spread out as China with so many different ethnic groups uh, had, right? <clears throat> One thing about China, you know, it's not only an enormous country geographically, but it is also very ethnically diverse, and there are um, speakers of different language, of different dialects spread across it, right? So, you know, a speaker of uh, Mandarin isn't necessarily going to understand everything that a speaker of Cantonese uh, will say. But Bai Hua is an attempt to come up with a vernacular language understandable more or less by everybody. And at the time Lu Sun was writing, there had been a couple of major historical developments. Right, first, as we noted, right, in the late 19th century, China had opened up once again to the rest of the world after several centuries of closed borders. In 1905, the <clears throat> official examinations were abolished. Now, do we remember what these were if we think back to the story of the stone? How did you get in imperial China a government job, a government position? What did you have to do? Yeah, like a civil service position, yeah. How would you get that position? Yes, you had to score high in the imperial examinations. And what did you have to study to take the imperial examinations? Um, Confucianism. Yep, the Confucian classics, right? So Confucian poetry, the Analects of Confucius, um, a couple of you know ancient historical texts, um, things of that nature. So the focus in these imperial examinations was primarily on tradition and the ancient world. Right. Very little that had much to do with administrating a modern country. And in 1912, <coughs> the Qing Dynasty, which had been ruling China since the 17th century, collapsed. And they were replaced by a relatively weak republic. So we have several major blows to tradition coming within a very, very brief historical span. Right, all of this within Lu Sun's lifetime. Now, Lu Sun himself is associated with what was called the New Culture Movement. And the New Culture Movement
was made of primarily of young Chinese intellectuals, many of whom had been abroad, some of whom had studied in Europe or the United States, several of whom had studied in, Ch in Japan. And they wanted to break the hold of traditional Confucianism on Chinese society. So we're looking at a movement that was sort of most powerful, most prominent in the 1910s, 1920s, that was looking to modernize what they saw um, as a static society. So their demands were, first, for a vernacular literature. Right? We don't want any more of this Wen Yan nonsense. Right? Literary texts, poetry, novels, plays should be written in the vernacular so that everyone can understand them. This actually kind of runs counter to a lot of Western modernisms, which tend to be really elitist. Right? For a lot of Western modernists, for example, someone like T.S. Eliot, um, if you don't understand his poem, good, you weren't supposed to. Chinese modernism is a bit more democratic in spirit. Secondly, they wanted to dismantle the patriarchal family and the concept of filial piety. Does anybody remember what we mean by filial piety if we think back to the story of the stone? You have to honor your parents always. Yep, the idea of honoring your parents. Right, this is one of those, you know, you know, this becomes a big sticking point, you know, between you know Jia Bao Yu and his father, right? This idea of filial piety. Thirdly, an end to the idea of Chinese exceptionalism. They argued that China should be regarded as simply one nation out of many, that while it has a unique cultural tradition, does not deserve to be regarded as somehow unique or superior because of that cultural tradition. They wanted to re-examine classic texts using modern critical and scientific methods. Right? We should not simply be reading Confucius, they would argue, um, and accepting everything that it says the way it's always been accepted. What we need to do is apply some of these new modern critical methods and think our way through this. Right? Look at it as a product of history rather than as you know, something passed down that we simply must obey, that we simply must adhere to. In a, in a way, yeah. Um, it's arriving in China you know, about a century after it ended in Europe. Um, but yeah, a lot of this is influenced by Western ideas. But some of it also has to do with some of these native political developments. So um, you know, I, I don't want us to look at this in terms solely of what was going on in Europe. What was going on in Europe was important and was influential especially as China was now part of a global system, again. They called for democracy and for egalitarianism. Right, an end to the old class systems. That in particular kept peasants apart from educated urban elites. And they called finally for a future-oriented rather than a past-oriented culture. So these were the aims of Lu Sun's literary movement. And they were expressed in the page. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. What's up? 
future-oriented culture? No, democracy is. And egalitarianism. E G A L I T A R I A N I S M. Pardon me. Do you spell it again? E G A L I T A R I A N I S M. Okay, sorry. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Okay, where was I? Um, so, right, Lu Sun was associated with this particular movement um, and published a lot of his stories. He actually didn't publish very many stories. His whole body of work uh, is, I think, about 25 short stories. Um, he published mostly in a magazine that was called New Youth, which was meant to draw attention to the idea that the youth of China, right, the new generation coming up, was going to be different from the ones that came before. That they were the ones who were going to change the world, change the culture. Now do we see, bless you, can we see any of these ideas at work in this particular story? What is it, we already, we, you know, we discussed this a little bit briefly, what is it that the narrator of the diary portion is so afraid of. Yeah, he's terrified that everyone around him is a cannibal. That everyone around him wants to eat him. How does he come to this realization? They were going to tear out his heart and his liver and eat it. Yeah, he thinks that he he thinks that's what they want to do to him, right? They want to tear out his liver, his heart and his liver and eat it. Yes. He's heard a story about a village where they've taken a bad man, who they blame for causing a famine, and they've taken out his heart and liver and eaten it. His brother. Mm-hmm. Like in the. Like a couple times in the story, uh -huh. I think most specifically on 246. No, is it 246? His brother um, told him, his older brother, about uh -huh. composition and how in the composition he was saying, he would say, weave in that his brother told him that, you know, people would eat their livers and like how you would eat whole ch children whole. Is this uh -huh. some sort of metaphor? Now that I think about it. Well, yes and no. Where is he <coughs> learning, by and large, about these acts of cannibalism? Other people. From other people, right? But like, from... From reading. <laughs> from reading, yeah. What sorts of things is he reading? If his brother is teaching him composition, what are they reading from? Confucianist texts. Yeah, from the Confucian classics, basically, right? And what is he finding in these Confucian classics? If we look, for example, page 246, the portion that you were talking about, as I see it myself, Though I'm not what you'd call an evil man, still, ever since I trampled the antiquity family's account books, it's hard to say what they'll do. They seem to have something in mind, but I can't begin to guess what. What's more, as soon as they turn against someone, they'll say he's evil anyway. I can still remember how it was when Elder Brother was teaching me composition. No matter how good a man was, if I could find a few things wrong with him, he would approvingly underline my words. On the other hand, if I made a few allowances for a bad man, he'd say I was an extraordinary student, an absolute genius. When all is said and done, how can I possibly guess what people like that have in mind, especially when you're getting ready for a cannibal's feast? So one thing that this relates to, we may remember some of this from when we looked at the story of the stone, right? Is the way the Confucian view of history works. Right? Two tenets to remember here. One, 
that from a Confucian viewpoint, historical change has both a natural and a moral cause. Right, so events in the world are very much tied up both with natural happenings and with <clears throat> the moral goodness or badness of particular people, and that historical figures can be picked out as exemplars of moral or immoral behavior. Right? So you read the, you know, the lives of individuals from history in order to give you guides to your own behavior. Right? This was a good person. This was a bad person. Follow this person's example. Do not follow this person's example. And what are the examples that he's finding in the Confucian histories keep telling him to do? Whether good or bad. If we look on page 248, and as for my own elder brother, I'm not being the least bit unfair to him. When he was explaining the classics to me, he said with his very own tongue that it was all right to exchange children and eat them. And then there was another time when he happened to start it on an evil man and said that not only should the man be killed, but that his flesh should be eaten and his skin used as a sleeping mat as well. When our tenant farmer came in from Wolf Cub Village a few days back and talked about eating a man's heart and liver, elder brother didn't seem to see anything out of the way in that either just kept nodding his head. You can tell from that alone that his present way of thinking is every bit as malicious as it was when I was a child. If it's all right to exchange children and eat them, then anyone can be exchanged. Anyone can be eaten. Back then, I just took what he said as an explanation of the classics and let it go as that. At that. But now I realize that while he was explaining, the grease of human flesh was smeared all over his lips. His mind was filled with plans for further cannibalism. So what the madman here is doing is taking a couple of events from the histories that he's had to study as a Confucian scholar out of context. Right, you know, the, the people of song, for example, in the example that he cites first, ate the children you know, of the town that had died because they were under siege and had nothing else to eat. Right? It was out of desperation. And he, igno he ignores the context of the other guy's speech as well, right? So he's taking these events out of context and saying that the classics give us not only excuses for cannibalism, but the command that we practice it. Right? If we follow the classics, we are told to eat people. Right. There's another bit uh, where he talks about historical figures at page 250. Right. <coughs> There's an old story from ancient times about Yi Ya boiling his son and serving him up to Ji uh, to Jie Zhao. But if the truth be known, people have always practiced cannibalism, all the way from the time when Pangu separated heaven and earth down to Yi Ya's son, down to uh, Chu Zilin, and down to the man they killed in Wolf Cub Village. And just last year, when they executed a criminal in town, there was even someone with TB who dunked a steamed bread roll in his blood and then licked it off. So these historical figures, these exemplars of behavior, ancient and recent, are people leaders. And this is why he's reading between the lines of these classic Confucian texts this tradition in which he's been educated, right? the words eat people 
underneath or in between these words benevolence, righteousness, and morality. Be benevolent, be righteous, be moral, and eat people. Do you notice any particular pattern to the acts of cannibalism he describes, who they're perpetrated against? People that he's partially aware of or close to. Okay, uh, give me an example. His little sister, who died. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, the little sister. And we'll actually sit on that for a minute because that speaks to a larger point that I want to get to. Where else do we see, what other sorts of people do we see here typically being eaten? Bad men. Or Bad men, yes. Right. That guy from the village. Who, call, who they say caused the plague or caused the famine, right? He was a bad man. They killed him, they ate his heart and liver. And how is bad man defined? If we think back to that part we were looking at earlier a second ago, right? What's more, as soon as they turn against someone, they'll say he's evil anyway. So who are the bad men? Who are the evil men? Have the bad have, have the bad men the turned on other humans? The people who've had cannibalism, who the people who are the victims of cannibalism. Do we have any evidence that the guy in that in Wolf Cub Village actually caused the famine? No. no. No, and in fact, he probably didn't, right? Science would tell us that um, human beings do not cause famines uh, by, you know, casting curses and waving bones about in the air, right? That just, you know, it doesn't happen. So he's not really the cause of the famine. He's a scapegoat, right? They've chosen him probably for being deviant in some other way, right? So the bad man, the evil man, is the one who is out of step <coughs> with the rest of society. Now, do we remember anything from our discussion of the story of the stone about how Confucianism envisions the universe? What's the most important thing in Confucianism? Your place in society. Your place in society, right? The whole thing is a sort of meta, you know, ritual as a metaphor, right? The universe is a great, big, beautiful ritual in which everyone has his or her place. You must learn to fill your particular place. You must learn to fulfill your particular function and remain in step with the ritual. Right. If one person falls out of step, then the whole ritual falls apart. Everything's ruined. So, for a, so from a Confucian viewpoint, bad people, evil people, are people who step out of the ritual. People who follow some other impulse. Now, what is it that might make this particular narrator worried about whether he is or is not one of these bad men. He seems like, I think he genuinely is maybe sort of sick because he, not outside of like, <laughs> outside uh -huh. of the um, you know, symbolism stuff, mm -hmm. he does he, he feels like he sees people, like, noticing him, and uh -huh. 
he feels eyes on him constantly and sure. seems genuinely paranoid. Yeah, it does look to us like paranoia, right? But is someone who's paranoid necessarily wrong? <laughs> In fact, if we look at his interactions with this other young man, right, on page, uh, page 249, actually, by now, even they should have long since understood the truth of this. Someone came in. Couldn't have been more than 20 or so. I wasn't able to make out what he looked like too clearly, but he was all smiles, right? Everyone is all smiles around him, and the smiles are usually sinister. His smile, uh, he nodded at me. His smile didn't look like the real thing either. And so I asked him, is this business of eating people right? He just kept right on smiling and said, except perhaps in a famine here, how could anyone get eaten? I knew right off he was one of them, one of those monsters who devour people. Yeah, what's weird about the young man's reaction to the question? He just keeps smiling. Yeah, he just keeps smiling. And if I, if I walked up to you on the, you know, with no context and said, hey, is it right to eat people? How would you probably react to me? What are you talking about? Like, what? Yeah, with <laughs> con confusion, shock, fear, right? It's like, what is wrong with this person? But this guy does not recoil in shock from the madman, right? He just keeps smiling and says very blandly, right? Well, except in a famine year, how would that ever happen? No one's getting eaten. Trust me. <laughs> At that point, my own courage increased a hundredfold, and I asked him, is it right? Why are you talking about this kind of thing anyway? You really know how to, uh, how to pull a fellow's leg. Nice weather we're having, right? Abrupt change of subjects to banal, bland conversation. The weather is nice. There's a nice moon out too, but I still want to know if it's right. He seemed quite put out with me and began to mumble, it's not, not right? Then how come they're still eating people? No one's eating anyone. No one's eating anyone? They're eating people in Wolf Cub Village this very minute. And it's written in all the books, too, written in bright red blood. His expression changed and his face went gray like a slab of iron. His eyes started out from their sockets as he said, maybe they are, but it's always been that way. It's just because it's been that way, does that make it right? I'm not going to discuss such things with you. If you insist on talking about that, then you're the one who's in the wrong. So what is it that the madman is doing that makes him bad. He's questioning the um, status quo. Yeah, he's questioning this community compact, right? It's like, no one talks about Fight Club, right? No one talks about eating people, right? No, 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 let's sweep this under the rug. Let's stop talking about this. Shut up, you're gonna ruin everything. So yeah, the young man that he's talking to here is not denying the fact of people getting eaten. What he is denying is that this is anything we should question or talk about. Right? Sweep this back under the rug. Put the genie back in the bottle. Let's talk about anything else. Yeah, go ahead. Like, I took, like, when I first read it, I took mm -hmm. it him as him being genuinely crazy, and mm -hmm. I took this particular section maybe like as evidence because mm -hmm. at the end of him saying that, he says that he leapt, I leapt from my chair, opened my eyes, and looked around, but uh -huh. the fellow was nowhere to be seen. I can, I thought that uh -huh. he was some sort of hallucination. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the. It's hard to say whether he is or isn't, right? Because again, we only have the so-called madman's word for it. But one thing we have to remember about the madman's narrative, too, are we receiving this direct from his mouth? No. We're receiving this through elder brother who's given it to someone else, right? So we're getting, like, third-hand information. And the guy who wrote the prologue notes 
that there are holes in this. Right? There are bits that are missing. There are bits that are illegible. So we also can't know for sure that this hasn't been tampered with in some way. But yeah, what the madman certainly thinks his crime is, right? What he thinks makes his society shun him or want to eat him is that he's pointing these things out, right? Hey, I have figured out the secret code and I'm not going to stand for this. Right? This is not something we should be doing. This is not something we should condone. Now, <clears throat> there is also something that, uh, in addition to the whole thing about the different dialects of the prologue and the diary itself, there's another effect in the story that comes across way more clearly um, in Chinese than it does in English. And this is that there are two words in Chinese for madman that are used in the text. The one that the madman used to, uses to refer to himself is Quangren. This term refers to a kind of madness that is more sort of like um, the sacred madness of an oracle or some sort of you know, divinely inspired, possessed um, being. Right, so it's ecstatic and defiant madness. Right, it's a madness that sort of runs counter to social norms, intentionally so. This is the word he uses for himself, right? I am the inspired maniac. That would actually probably be a good translation of the uh, inspired maniac would be holy hermits of the woods and things like that. And there is a tradition in Confucianism of these kind these Quambran coming up and challenging Confucius. Right, in the Analects, um, in book 18, verse 5, Confucius conf is confronted by a character who is called the Madman of Chu. Ji Yu, the Madman of Chu, went past Confucius singing, Phoenix, O oh Phoenix, the, the past cannot be retrieved, but the future still holds a chance. Give up, give up, the days of those in office are numbered. Confucius stopped his chariot for he wanted to speak with him, but the other hurried away and disappeared. Confucius did not succeed in speaking to him. So the madman shows up to shout at Confucius that his quest for order, his quest for resurrecting the old social uh, norms, are, th this is fruitless because everything is in a state of constant flux. Everything is in a state of constant change. So the madman is a challenging figure. But the term that others use to refer to the narrator is <coughs> Fengren. And Fengren is closer to a sort of like medical or legal definition of insanity, right? Fengren would translate, it's a much newer word than Quangren, and it translates more or less literally to neurotic. So he refers to himself as someone who is inspired, but everyone around him refers to him as someone who is sick. Now, let's bring this back for a minute to, um, Ashley, you drew attention to the point about younger sister. What's going on there? What's happened with younger sister? She died when she was five. Uh-huh. 
And I thought when I first read it, when I just thought that it was an account of a very, very sad, sick person, mm -hmm. I thought it was some sort of manifestation of guilt. Uh-huh. Like, uh, I didn't save my sister even though he was small. Let's look at the way this plays out over parts 11 and 12 of the diary here, right? Can I get a volunteer to read part 11? Yeah, okay, go ahead, Ashley. You can read part 11. The sun doesn't come out. The door doesn't open. It's two meals a day. I picked up my chopsticks, and that got me thinking about Elder Brother. I realized that the reason for my younger sister's death lay entirely with him. I can see her now, such a lovable and helpless little thing. Only five at the time. Mother couldn't stop crying but he urged her to stop, probably because he'd eaten sister's flesh himself, hearing mother cry over her like that shamed him. But if he's still capable of feeling shame, then maybe. Younger sister was eaten by brother. I have no way of knowing whether mother knew about it or not. I think she did know, but while she was crying, she didn't say anything about it. She probably thought it was all right too. I can remember once when I was four or five, I was sitting out in the courtyard, taking in a cool breeze when Elder Brother told me that when parents are ill, a son, in order to be counted as a really good person, should slice off a piece of his own flesh, boil it, and let them eat it. At the time, Mother didn't come out and say there was something wrong with that. But if it was all right to eat one piece, then certainly one wouldn't be anything wrong with her eating the whole body. And yet when I think back to the, day, to the way she cried and cried that day, it's enough to break my heart. It's all strange, very, very strange. Okay, so let's think about the little story there that Elder Brother tells in the courtyard. Now, this is not something that Elder Brother has made up. Right? This is, you know, an, an ancient proverb, especially that a child should always support and honor the parent in any possible way. Right. What do we call this concept? Filial. Yeah, this is filial piety taken to the extreme. Right. Yeah, so it, yeah, well, exactly what Elder Brother is saying is that filial piety demands you do whatever you have to do to support your parents. If that means cutting off a piece of yourself, cooking it and serving it to them, then you do it, right? You owe your parents everything. We'll just put that up there for a second. Now, can I get somebody to read part 12 here? Yeah, Jonathan, go for it. Can't think about it anymore. I just realized today that I, too, have muddled around for a good many years in a place where they've been continually eating people for thousands of years. Younger sister happened to die at just the time that an elder brother was in charge of the house. Who's to say he didn't slip some of her meat into the food we ate? Who's to say I didn't eat a few pieces of my younger sister's flesh without knowing it? And now it's my turn. Although I wasn't aware of it in the beginning, now that I know I'm someone with 4,000 years of experience of cannibalism behind me, how hard is it to look real human beings in the eye? Thank you. So what's the realization that he's coming to here? That he's already done it. It's a part of him. It's <coughs> of him. Yeah, he's accepting that he's probably done it too. Right? Well, if elder brother and mother ate younger sister, then I probably had some part in the feast, right? I didn't know it, but that doesn't make me any less guilty. Now, so what that this comes so close to the end of his narrative? What do we know has happened to him subsequently? It seems like he's broken. What do you mean by broken? Like he was raging and raging and raging mm -hmm. and manic about like cannibalism and yeah. eating people, and now he's just like slowly tapered down uh -huh. and accepted that yeah. he's eaten some of his sister. It's been going on for for four thousand years, and I've done it too, right? So, where is he actually in the now of the story? Locked up in a room. Nope. No, he's not, right? Remember that these are his past musings, right? Um, it's the same sort of thing we had with the uh, with Notes from Underground, right? 
the second part of Notes from Underground is taking place in the narrator's distant past. Where is he now? Is he waiting for a job? Yeah, he's been sent off, he's been completely cured, sent off to another town, and is waiting to take up his official post, right, in the regular, ordinary Confucian government. So, it seems almost like, as these things are coming together at the end of the story, his cure and his reintegration into society is dependent upon his acceptance of this fact of cannibalism. So his cure was conformity? Yeah. Particularly if we think of madness as deviation, right? As madness, as someone who's not behaving like a normal person. And most psychotherapy aims to take someone who's not behaving normally and make them conform to some kind of standard, right? We're going to bring you back to the normal social standard, right? To be cured is to be normal. But to be normal here is to be a cannibal. Where are they learning cannibalism in his musings? The old ways. The old ways, and who's been transmitting the old ways? Family? Family. They learned it from their parents. Right, if we look back to page 245, right, when he first notices people are looking at him strangely, he hasn't even figured out the thing about cannibalism yet. <clears throat> but I wasn't going to let that intimidate me. I kept right on walking. There was a group of children up ahead, and they were talking about me too. The expressions in their eyes were just like the venerable old Zhao's, and their faces were iron gray. I wonder what grudge the children had against me that they were acting this way, too. I couldn't contain myself any longer and shouted, tell me, tell me, but they just ran away. Let's see now, what grudge can there be between me and the venerable old Zhao or the people in the street for that matter? But the only thing I can think of is that 20 years ago I trampled the account books kept by Mr. Antiquity and he was hopping mad about it, too. Though the venerable old Zhao doesn't know him, he must have gotten wind of it somehow. Probably decided to right the injustice I had done Mr. Antiquity by getting all those people in the street to gang up on me. But the children? Back then, they hadn't even come into the world yet. Why should they have given me those funny looks today? Seemed as though they were afraid of me, and yet, at the same time, looked as though they would like to do me some harm. That really frightens me, bewilders me, hurts me. I have it. Their fathers and mothers have taught them to be like that. So these negative social values that cause people to gang up on the different, that cause people even children to commit acts of cannibalism in the story are taught by parents and by the demands of this system of tradition. So we can see now how this relates to some of the values of that new culture movement, right? right the family is a negative influence Right, so destroy the, you know, destroy the patriarchal family, destroy status within society, level everyone, reevaluate the Confucian classics. Now one last thing I want to point to, because we're running a little bit short on time here. What do you make of this last little bit at the end of the story? On page 253, the final jotting in the madman's diary. So the last, what are the last three, let, let, let's actually look at what you just said in terms of the last three words on the page there, right? So you are suggesting that when he says save the children, dot, 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 
he means save the children from this vicious tradition, right? Don't indoctrinate them any further into this. Is there another possible interpretation? Save them from being eaten, <laughs> them from being eaten right? We've just talked about younger sister and what happened to her at the age of five, right? That we're talking about people who are not above eating children. So the meaning of save the children is ambiguous. It could mean save the children from tradition, stop teaching them these horrible things. It could mean save the children from being eaten, save the children from being devoured by their parents or by other people's parents, or by anyone, right? Stop eating people. And a lot of this has to do with the way Lu Sun saw society as being set up. And this is, you may recognize this little formulation. If we look on page 248, little chapterling six, he says, savage is a lion, timid is a rabbit, Crafty as a fox. The lions are the oppressors at the top of society. The predators who take what they want by force. The rabbits are the oppressed. The weak who are victimized by the lions. And the fox represents cunning, clever people who take their prey through deceit and through trickery, right, who find ways to get around the existing power structure. Savage is a lion, timid as a rabbit, crafty as a fox. There's another point where he talks about, uh, I, I can't find it here at the moment, but he talks about, uh, you know, watching people be abusive to people who are weaker, th weaker than them while also sucking up to those who are above them. That's exactly like the underground man schema in Dostoevsky, right? So his reading of Russian literature shows in this as well. All right, so does anybody have any questions about any of this or anything else that you want to say? Yeah, Ashley. Okay. Like, I get at how at the end the save the children bit is uh -huh. like super duper ambiguous. Right. Is what happened exactly to younger sister supposed to be just as ambiguous? Okay, I guess the I, I would answer your question with a question. Is there anything in it, since what we are presented with is ostensibly the musings of a social deviance presented by someone else, a sober Confucian scholar, is there anything in the story that's not ambiguous? So yeah, I, he has no proof that he has eaten his younger sister, that anyone has eaten his younger sister or really that anyone has eaten anyone. This is all just his conjecture based on the evidence that he sees around him. All right, anything else? All right, I do have some reading questions for you for next time. We're gonna be looking at an example of Caribbean modernism. <coughs> Emé Césaire's um, <coughs> Caribbean Surrealist Notebook of Return to the Native Land. And is that light? Yes, good. And once you've got what you need here, you are free to go. See you on Thursday.